Hey, welcome back to the Flex Diet Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. So on the podcast, we focus on all things to enhance your performance, which could be competitively or in the gym, uh, body composition, and all without destroying your health in a flexible paradigm. So today I've got my friend, Dr. Brandon Roberts on. We talk about a lot of really fun stuff. We had, he was at one of the dinners at ISSN recently. Uh, you can check out the other podcast I did with Dr. Guillermo Escalante. <clears throat> he was there at the same uh, dinner. So I wanted to, you know, get some of these guys on basically to pick their brain more or less on just really fascinating topics that they've spent a lot of time researching. So in this one, our main topic is looking at the effect of NSAIDs like uh, Advil, et cetera, on muscle growth. Uh, so Dr. Roberts has done some very interesting studies on this uh, for the military, looking at different effects of <clears throat> COX-1 and COX-2. And then we kind of go all across the board uh, talking about you know science versus being a researcher versus being a coach and a practitioner. And Dr. Roberts has been on both ends of the spectrum, which is great. Uh, some of the old school uh, supplements we've tried and have not really worked out so well in the past. Uh, some genetic stuff, which he's done work in. Uh, we did a discussion about some uh, the effects of myostatin, right? People may remember the old uh, pictures of the Belgian blue and uh, was a dog also uh, from a single versus a double myostatin null. What does that mean for muscle growth? And <clears throat> is there pros and cons um, to that? Uh, so check out this podcast with Dr. Brandon Roberts. And thank you so much for listening. As always, it's brought to you by the Flex Diet Certification. You can get more information at www.flexdiet.com, F-L-E-X-D-I-E-T.com. Go to the wait list there. That'll put you onto the daily newsletter. And as soon as it opens again, you'll be the first to be notified. And you also get more exclusive content there also. So go to flexdiet.com, make sure you get on the newsletter, and enjoy this podcast with Dr. Brandon Roberts. And welcome to Flex Diet Podcast. We're back here again. Uh, today we're here with Dr. Brandon Roberts. Say hi. Hey guys, great pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah, thank you so much for being on. Um, we... Got to sit next to you at the ISSN President's Dinner again, which was uh, super fun. Uh, we had Dr. Guillermo Escalante on just the other week, which was great to talk to him. And uh, one of the things I love about going to conferences, again, it was super nice to go to a, a live conference. I confess, I, I won't say what organization put it on. And the conference they did virtually was really, really good, like really top name speakers, and it was great. But I got through like two and a half hours and I just couldn't sit in front of my computer anymore and hack it. <laughs> so it was yeah. great to actually go to a live conference to get up between speakers, you know, to go to dinners, hang out at the bar and just talk to people about all sorts of uh, different topics. So that was great. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I, you know, echo that sentiment, but there's a lot as a scientist, as you know, that goes on kind of in between stuff at conferences where totally. you're like, talking about science and like you know you go have a few drinks and you're like i've got this idea yeah and then t you know five years later you're like writing a grant and doing a study on the idea so you know it was, it was super cool because like you sat down next to me i was like oh i know mike i never <laughs> actually met mike it yeah was fun um and yeah we had some pretty good conversations on that and the the table too so yeah it was fun i wish it was almost it's probably some way you can do it but for years i've had this idea of if you could just record like a dinner conversation there, you know, I don't know how well that would go over to the lay audience and maybe some stuff you'd have to, you yeah. know, some of the weird borderline proprietary and other stuff is not published. You may have to edit a few things out, but, um, yeah, I had that idea, like the first ACSM conference I went to 2004, I think. Um, and then that's like before podcasting was really a thing. And then now it's nice to have just kind of, follow-up conversations too which is great yeah yeah definitely i uh yeah and for people who may not be familiar with your work do you want to give us uh your your background because i 
not only do you do bodybuilding competitions, but you're working with the military and you have a super unique background, which I find is always fascinating. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was, um, let's say, bred as a, a traditional academic. Um, so I went to University of Florida for my undergrad. I did a molecular biology degree. And I did a lot of bacterial and virus research. And, you know, as I was going through it, I was like, this is really cool, but, you know, I really love exercise. How can I get into exercise? I was like, there's not really molecular biology and exercise. And I was like, oh, wait. Somebody introduced me to kind of the human performance molecular exercise kind of track and exercise science in general. And I was like, oh, I can do this. Um, so I did a master's to make sure that it would kind of be what I thought and work out. Um, got... Uh, got in with a good PI, young PI. Um, we were actually studying muscle loss, so like muscle wasting mm. during um, cancer or like when you get put in a cast or um, just like denervation, so you get a nerve damage type thing. Um, and so I did that for my master's and my PhD, but I was still kind of like hunting and searching and not like super happy about studying muscle loss. And at the same time, I was kind of learning about, you know, the different organizations and, um, I was training on the side and I was really just falling in love the whole, my whole on like undergrad master's, uh, PhD, just falling in love with like training just in general. I'd play every sport, um, go train every day, um, slowly learning like the evidence-based community existed. So it was kind of cool because <laughs> I was, I was following your stuff back then. I was like, Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. Well, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and, and it's exploded since then, but, um, you know, there weren't that many people around back then. Um, so yeah, so I was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta transition into like hypertrophy strength training, like research just with my molecular stuff, um, and my muscle biology background. So my PhD was in muscle biology. Um, and so I did, went and did a postdoc with uh, Dr. Bauman, who is one of the like two people in the United States that studies muscle growth and does muscle biopsies and does big clinical trials. And when I say big, you're talking, you know, 60 to 150 people, somewhere yeah. in there. But for that so kind like, of work, that's massive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Pulling in like millions of dollars or getting paid millions of dollars by the NIH to do this work. Um, so I did that for a few years and I kind of really learned a ton in my postdoc. My PhD was good, but my postdoc was just like, oh, wow, you actually are a scientist now. Um, especially on the like grant side and the paper, you know, publishing mm -hmm. side. You know, get into that a little bit. Um, so at the same time, I was also kind of going in with um, some different companies. So I started with uh, the strength guys online training. Oh, uh, cool. Yeah. So I was with them for like four, four years. I think it was like 2015 to 19 or so. Um, so I trained powerlifters and bodybuilders. And at the same time I competed in bodybuilding. Um, so I was actually writing my dissertation and prepping for a, my uh, competition at the same time, oh, which was, that's gotta be absolutely freaking horrible. It, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I wouldn't advise it. Um, I made it, and I, it was it was basically I made it because I was so far ahead. Like we had stopped doing experiments for a while, and and it was kind of like an in between time for our lab. And so I just had six months to take my time, write my dissertation, and do a do a prep, um, and not much else. So it was it wasn't that bad, but it was, you know, mentally a little hard sometimes. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. So. Yeah, so I, then I, when I went to my postdoc, or a little bit before that, I started online training, um, worked with strength guys, then I worked with Macro Zinc for about a year, um, just coaching, just getting more, more and more coaching experience. I just wanted, like, because I'm learning the science at the same time as I'm coaching, I can kind of, like, bring those two together, right? Yeah. And, and for me, that just, like, coaches have a lot of really good ideas. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, so um, kind of combining those. And then um, kind of figured out that the traditional academ academic life wasn't really for me. It like wasn't like I had figured it out already. I didn't want to spend at least that in the next few years um, becoming a professor and kind of going that route. I was like, OK, I got this figured out. I can come back to this if I want. And, I'm, and I was good at it. So yeah. I Especially having going, done a postdoc, too, and all the work you put into it. I mean, so that's you, yeah. you did all the requirements by far. Yeah. And so, and I have a lot of, lots of friends in, in academia. Like I was talking with Grant and Abby Smith Ryan and, and all those yeah. people. Um, 
and, it, and it's super fun, but I just was, I wasn't ready to, to do that yet. And so I was like, okay, I've been, been thinking about joining the army since I was like an undergrad hmm. and the army actually has lab techs. So you like, you can be a research technician, um, on the enlisted side, but I, I didn't really want to go on the enlisted side cause they have to do a lot of stuff and it's really hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it, it's good and you can use it to your advantage, but it's just hard, hard life. Uh, so I basically commissioned in after my postdoc. And so I have been in about a year, maybe a little bit over a year now, um, and kind of went to, uh, through officer training and stuff like that. Um, but it was an opportunity to kind of continue doing what I wanted, so that, like the science side, because um, I'm at uh, a place that studies exercise science in the military. So it kind of worked out. Uh, but also it gives me more of like a, a leadership and, and even like a physical activity role where I'm like, you know, still young enough to get out there and, and ruck, you know, 12 miles with a 50 pound pack on like that stuff's kind of fun. Right. Um, and, and as you kind of age up, you get more responsibility, you have kids, you, you know, all this other stuff. So I was like, okay, let's try this for, let's say three to five years. And if I love it, keep with it. And if I don't, maybe go back to academia. So that's where I'm at now. Um, I also am a chief science officer for two different companies. Um, so tailored coaching method. So that's a coaching company. So I coach the coaches for them, basically keep them on track with the science. And it's a really good group. Um, and then a nutrition company called Log Smarter. Um, and then I write for weightology and I write for examine. So I stay pretty busy, but I like all of the stuff I do. So it's not like a chore. So Mr. Krieger isn't too hard on you at weightology. You do all right? Yeah, yeah. No, he's. I, I love James. He's good. He's he's got a really good scientific mind too. So yeah, yeah. I finally got to meet him at the Fitness Summit conference a couple of years ago. So we had talked back and forth and read obviously a lot of his stuff and yeah. So it was we kept sort of missing each other at conferences. Like he would be at the one I was at or I'd be the one before or that type of thing. So yeah. Very cool. And obviously, the guys examined do really good work too, which is nice to see them doing well and trying to stay very focused on what the actual science is, especially being geared more towards supplements. It's, yeah, you see a lot of, we'll say, interesting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've reviewed a couple of studies where I'm like, did they make this up? I can't tell, but I can't, you know, when, when somebody publishes something, you can't be like, no that's made up. You have to be like, no, that doesn't really fit the bounds of what we know. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. Like, uh, H and B free acid, maybe not to throw anyone under the bus, but you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You occasionally, you usually get some stuff like that where you're like, or there's a, there's a good bit of re research on ashwagandha, which is super cool. But there's like a couple studies. If you look at them, you're like, they put how, 20, 20 pounds of muscle on and how long? Yeah. Oh, okay. You yeah, know, so you, you know, but, stuff slips through the cracks and journals matter a little bit so i try not to hate on people too much yeah yeah i always get my little bs detector goes off when the data just looks way too clean and just way outside the bounds of what just seems reasonable you know and that that's very kind of unscientific -y, but i mean there's ways you can look at you know variations in data and that kind of stuff and cv etc but when you publish something that is a supplement and looks like uh, your first steroid cycle results, and then you couple that with no one in the real world is talking about this thing. That's the part to me that's always fascinating. It's like how, what do you really expect is going to happen, right? Because you know from being around bodybuilding and training that, you know, something tends to work pretty good. Obviously, there's a placebo effect, which can be massive, um, but stuff just tends to you know what sort of works and what doesn't sort of work, right? You've been around long enough to see the latest things come up and have a ton of hype and they just kind of disappear because, you know, eh, people tried them and nothing really happened, you know? So yeah. when you're seeing some study that says massive gains here and everyone else is like, I don't know, it didn't happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's that's the, I try to stay connected with, you know, coaches and then even athletes to, to make sure that that like, I don't like lose track of that aspect. Yeah. Cause that's, it's super important. Like, and you don't, sometimes you don't know until like you're so, some of these scientists are so far removed yeah. from all like the groundwork. You're like, well, I got to make sure I go back in there occasionally and stay on track. Um, but yeah, the supplement world is a little crazy. And like you said, um, 
you know, we know high protein works, but we've known that for, for quite a while. <laughs> so Yeah. Yeah. My last comment on that too is it's the system is set up as this huge catch twenty two, right? Because if you're a new supplement company, do you even have to spend any money on research? Not really. I mean, I think you should, obviously, but there's no requirement that says you have to. You know, so again, if you're gonna run a study and it's gonna cost you a lot of money, I get that you're probably gonna have some vested interest in it, hopefully turning out somewhat positive. You know, and then you get into the debate of well, who actually owns the data? If you contract with the university, um, does the supplement company own the data because they bought and paid for the study? And if it doesn't turn out too positive and they own the data, then it'll probably disappear and never get published. You know, so all that sort of stuff comes into play too, which makes it messy. <laughs> yeah, I always I always feel bad for the students who like, because I mean, you know, if you're a supplement company, even big or small, doesn't matter. You wanna you wanna do a little bit of science. And yeah, you can, but you do, like you said, you don't want it to go bad. But right. usually there's a, there's, a, there's a PhD or a master's student on the other side running that project, and yep. they just get, like, the paper just, like, yanked out of their hands. <laughs> You're like, no! Yeah, that's always my advice to them. It's like, just be wary because if it works well, it can be really good, right? And there are companies who do research, and they're not as vested interest into what actually happens. You know, here's the money, figure it out. That's great. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I did one of my PhD studies was on, you know, Monster Energy Drink. And people are like, oh, did you be sponsored by Monster? I'm like, nope. I paid for Monster out of my own pocket, actually. And part of that was probably a good thing because they weren't offering up a huge amount of money. And I'm like, whatever happens, like, they don't really have any control over it then either. You know, so as long as I can get all the other stuff I need to be funded by the lab and I'm not occurring a huge amount of cost out of my own pocket per se, I kind of rather go that route because... You know, especially back, you know, eight, nine years ago, everybody thought energy drinks were either going to magically give you wings and you're going to just do amazing on all your tests or they were the devil's brew and they were just going to destroy your health. I'm like, either way, it'll probably get published. <laughs> yep, that's, that's a good outlook. I like that. I didn't have to, uh, is it, I have to go back and look at some of that stuff. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, going back to something real quick is you mentioned you're looking at uh, denervation studies. So for people who are listening, that's basically where you just kind of cut the nerve to a muscle. And if I remember right, that's probably one of the fastest ways to lose muscle tissue, correct? With the exception of maybe microgravity. Yeah, yeah. I was literally thinking, yeah, yeah. If you send, if you go to space, you'll lose it faster. But that's about the only way. And actually, you know, some of the nerve studies we would use as like a rapid onset um, atrophy model. So like if we wanted to test, because we did a lot of genetic stuff. So say we thought a gene was involved and we knocked it out or we gave it and made it increase the expression. We would do denervation real quick to say, huh, is it is it doing anything mm. in the muscle, right? And it's like a it's like a three day model in a an animal, a rodent, um, wow. mouse. Yeah, but you know it's not super applicable, but it's a quick peek. It's like, huh, well, yay or nay? Let's see. Yeah, in rare cases, I've seen some case studies of that where someone's been in, like, uh, obviously the military, you could have, you know, shrapnel, that kind of stuff, motor vehicle accidents, things like that, where you you have a lot of physical damage and obviously a lot of trauma. But whenever you slice through that nerve, though, you can just see, just even in humans, just massive loss of, of muscle, which, yeah, to me is, it's fascinating how something like that, how fast you can lose it. And then on the other side, how hard it is to try to add more muscle. It's like this very weirdly asymmetrically weighted thing. Yeah, actually, that's a, you know, that's a good point. I've never really thought of it that way. But yeah, that, that's kind of sad. That just makes you know, it is. Oh, it's depressing. <laughs> <laughs> just, just be like, I don't want to lose muscle. But um, I think the closest thing in humans to that is like, um, so the couple examples you gave, but like spinal cord injury, yes. you see some similar effects where like you can't walk and now you're losing muscle and you can't, you may not be able to use your legs and then you get diabetes and then all this other stuff happens. So. Yeah. I, I remember asking Stu Phillips this question years ago too. And I'm like, can you, we put people in like, hypergravity or do like more constant loading like jose antonio did the old uh chronic wing weighting studies on birds where he like put these weights on one of their wings and showed hyperplasia right so splitting of actual fibers but 
That only seems to work in birds who walk around with a weight stuck to their wing the whole time. Doesn't seem to happen in humans, but you know, there's some interesting stuff now with adding like a weight vest to people of, you know, can you sort of trick their body into thinking it's at a heavier weight? So you have to move it around all the time for weight loss. And I don't know. I always thought that was just kind of an interesting concept. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, so we, um, in the military, we deal with that a little bit because yeah, of you the do a lot of heavy weighted stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So just the rucking, it's essentially like, you know, you're, 20 to 50 or sometimes 100 pounds depending on sometimes they scale to body weight so it'll be like 30 percent body weight some of our studies and sometimes it's just like a flat number like 30 pounds or 40 pounds um but yeah yeah some of the some of the research around the uh, mechanostat or mechanostat yeah. however you want to say it is it's kind of interesting because it's like well you know we put a weight vest on and and we can keep up our energy expenditure or maybe some kind of sensors in us somewhere um, to make us lose fat or weight as we were, well, then that's kind of neat if we can eat the same. Yeah. The other, the other example I always think of too is I've never seen a really large mammal with small calves, right? <laughs> like you'll see the exception, right? You'll see some, some people who are very small and have just these monster calves. You're like, how the heck? And like most of the time they don't train, which is even more crazy. Um, but I've never seen someone who was a very large human with like small calves. And I was always wondering if that's because you have to exert pressure on them all the time via walking and, and load because they're so far down on the kinetic chain too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's even a study on calves specifically and it's like hmm. to see anything, I, I forget who did it, but Sean Feld's probably on it. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's probably on it somewhere. Yeah. Um, it was like training calves four times a week, basically, with like four sets a, a, a per session or something. It was just like barely enough to move the needle. And mm. you're like, wow, yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. And and I, I definitely agree with the weight thing because like I used to be – so in college I was like two – I fluctuated between 205 and then 220, which is I'm like 5'8 on a good day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so I had some muscle, but I was I had a good bit of fat. And then I lost – um, probably like 50 or 60 pound went down to like 160 and I was pretty shredded. Um, but like my calves have always kind of stuck around and I'm like, hmm. Oh, hey, thank you. <laughs> thank you <for> <laughs> uh, yeah. The best I ever had for increase in muscle mass on my calves, which are not very big was I took a summer and did, uh, the same amount of like kind of lower calf, uh, body stuff that I was doing. And then I added like just a ton ton of farmer's walks and I did it in kind of like a barefoot type shoe and so I would okay. do that sometimes two three four times a week you know not always heavy but just kind of mixing it up and um yeah I put like on like in four or five months like almost uh not quite an inch on my calves I think because my wow. thought was can I just you know pretend like I'm a heavy person right can I just carry this amount of load like all the time and who knows, right? It might have even been that. It could have just been the increase of volume. Could have been a different stimulus because I hadn't done a lot of it before. Uh, yeah. Who knows? But yeah, always interesting. Yeah, it's it's fun to to like use yourself as an experiment sometimes. I think. Definitely. Because there's uh, man during my postdoc, we I got into response individuality basically, so mm -hmm. heterogeneity. Um, and I presented a, a fun presentation at the. Uh, IEFC out in was it Spokane? Um, it's a fitness conference out there. Uh, but like, there's so much variability sometimes when you look at training and even nutrition, even with that good adherence. And it's yes. like sometimes you kind of just have to experiment on yourselves. Like, of course, there's some some scientific principles you should have in there. But you know, if if you want to try some stuff like that, like go for it. So. Yeah, when I, I saw Stu Phillips at ACSM years and years ago, I think it was might have been when I was in Seattle that year, um, but he was presenting some data on a hypertrophy study that they ran, and it was great because he put up the scatter plot, right? So for people listening, it's a plot of the end results of this, I think it was an 8 or 10, 12-week program of, you know, how much lean body mass all these people gain, and it's typical. Like, you're looking at it, like most of the people are kind of around the middle. I don't remember what the exact number was. Uh, one poor guy actually technically and it was a measurement error but he actually lost mass <laughs> he was like down below at the bottom <laughs> so one poor bastard got worse 
And these two other people were like way up at the top, like two standard deviations above everyone else. And so we asked him, like, hey, like, what's what's going on with that? And he's like, oh, he, he nicknamed them. He called them the Beef Brothers. So there's these <laughs> two guys who were brothers, actually. They both grew up on a farm and they ate like, you know, two or three pounds of beef a day, you know, worked as farmers. And they did the same program as everyone else. Like it was a training study. It wasn't necessarily a nutrition study. Um, and that kind of led them to looking at, well, like what's going on with them, right? So some of the, the hyper responder studies. And so if I remember correctly, that led to some of the hormone hypothesis that David West then did stuff on that. Maybe these guys are like hyper responders to testosterone with training because they're, they're doing the same training stuff as everybody else. So like what's going on, you know, and that study, very elegantly designed study showed, yeah, yeah, you get big bumps in growth hormone and testosterone from, you know, doing squats and compound exercises, but doesn't really translate into any more uh, muscle mass. So I didn't, given your background in genetics, do you think there's probably a genetic predisposition for some of that, that even with the same amount of load or stimulus that some people for whatever reason in their genetics just tend to respond better? I, th I think that's part of it. I, we've, so we've been looking for like a hypertrophy gene and right. uh, like, like, you know, and, and we've never found something, a single, single, like, you know, you want to call a single snip. Like, yeah. Yeah. A single snip that is, can explain more than like three to 4% of yeah. the responses, which is horribly get. low. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're looking at depressing <laughs> and you get three to 4% in, this, in a single, you know, snip. And then you're like, okay, well now I've got to make this snip panel. And so then you maybe get like 50% of the response or 60 if you're lucky. So you're combining and, other things, right? Yeah. So you're combining all these genes and you're like, well, you know, if I have to put a hundred genes in there, like, <laughs> <laughs> like we're not that different as humans. I mean, uh, it's kind of reaching a little bit. So I think, I think, you know, it's partially kind of your, your environment growing up, you know, the, the just kind of nutritional environment you're in and whatever sports you may play that plays a role too. But a lot of times when you look at these hyper responders, they're like, they've done nothing and they're just already jacked. Yeah. And yeah. you're just like, where did you get all that muscle, sir? I yeah. don't know. <laughs> Yeah, like the story of, I think it was Andy Bolton, right? So people listening, one of the first guys to deadlift over a 1,000 pounds. I want to say the first time he ever trained, I think he deadlifted 600, um, squatted 500, and benched like 450 or something like that. Like the first time he ever really, it, I, I could be off on the numbers, but he was deadlifting over five. You yeah. Know? And I'm just like... What? <laughs> I've been training my whole life. I've never hit those numbers. <laughs> I know. Or you see like the the pictures of Lee Priest when he's like 18, and you know, granted he had been training for you know four to five years. I think he said he started training at age 13, but still, it's like he he could just walk up on a bodybuilding stage in almost any state and just destroy people at 18. You know, and it's like yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I've I've had to, I think one of the mistakes I made early in my like bodybuilding career was like trying to like compare yourself to other people and that just oh never yeah goes well. that just yeah. never goes well. <laughs> so. What are your thoughts about myostatin? Because that seems to stick out. Like everyone's seen the pictures of the, you know, cool. the dogs that are myostatin null and the the blue gen, the blue gen bell bull, I think. And I think there was was there one human i think a kid in germany that was double negative i think if i remember right yeah yeah so um that's a that's one of my favorite like lectures that i've i've given is i have a genetics you know kind of enhancement a lecture um that i gave my students and so yeah you put up the picture of the bull and you're like why is that bull so jacked and then you yeah. give the he wasn't jacket. in the gym lifting either <laughs> no, just, eating. <laughs> just eating just fueling his gains out yeah. there on the, on the farm um so basically in in rodents if you knock out myostatin um you get these big muscle effects but like functionally they're not better so you have this like fake hypertrophy almost um and there's like a, a long series of experiments that kind of figured that out um but pharma companies right have still thought hey you know we've got these cows these rodents seem to make sense and, and then there's a couple i think there's a couple kids that are like 
semi knockouts or don't have the myostatin genes and you look at them and, and young they're like jack mm -hmm. like they have six packs at age like five yeah uh, um and the one from germany he's actually still alive but he he kind of looks like he leveled out i think he's mm. on youtube or something um but he's not like super duper jacked he's not like ronnie coleman or anything he's just kind of like uh you know a lean more muscular than usual but not yeah. like a complete outlier no, no. Something mm. that most people could attain with a little work. Um, but so the pharma companies develop these myostatin antibodies. And obviously from a muscle wasting perspective, like if you can get give that to someone who's losing muscle, that's amazing. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a money maker. And so they a couple different companies ran trials and they all got shut down. Hmm. And, and so during my dissertation, I dug into it a little bit, um, but it turns out that some of the participants in those studies were having internal bleeding, which is bad, yeah. um, <laughs> which is, yeah, which is why the studies got shut down. Um, now, you know, with antibodies, you can like science have, has evolved. Obviously you see like the mRNA vaccines now we didn't have those 10 years ago. Um, so there's always potential for it to come back around, but I think, for now, it's kind of like, uh, just put it on the back burner and come back to it. So. Yeah. And I think some of like the top bodybuilders, I think isn't Flex Wheeler and some of those guys supposedly like a single, a single myostatin null supposedly when they've had their genetics tested, I heard. Yeah. I think, I think some bodybuilders claim that whether it's true or not. I yeah. Heard. I've never been able to find anything that says. <laughs> yeah your nay and it could be just one of those rumors you hear 800 times you're like mm, maybe it's true i don't know <laughs> yeah, sounds right um i think i've only done i've done the 23 and me genetic panel just for fun mm -hmm. um, and it was like eh, it was okay like it didn't yeah. tell me anything special and i was like yeah i could have figured that stuff out myself but yeah it was fun um, you probably remember folostatin as a myostatin uh, supplement and then they had the super old school God, what was the one from the seaweed? Was it Myozap, I think, was like the trade name that was supposed oh, to man. inhibit um, myostatin. It was it was a biotest <laughs> pinnacle, and there's one other company on it for a while. I'm kind of dating myself, but that was like a big thing a long time ago. I think right around when the, the ads would show like pictures of like the Belgian blue bulls and talk about the mechanism and... Yeah, they never panned out, but <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't remember the seaweed one, but I do re remember the Falstatin stuff, and I think I never bought it, but I remember seeing it in magazines and in like GNC and like, yeah, like oh look at that one, but it's so expensive. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy expensive. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a couple of supplements as a, you know, as a teenager, I was like, that's ridiculous. I would totally buy it if I had the money, and now I'm like, I have the money and I don't want it. What were the other two? Do you remember? Oh man! So do you remember? Um, I think it was GAC or Yak or something. Yeah, yeah, from Muscle yeah. Tech. Yeah. Yeah, all the Muscle Tech stuff. Just it was so shiny. Yeah. And like it, just, it was, it was like, in the lock like, case, bro. So it had to be good. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> or the um, what was it? The uh, the not the androgen, fake androgens. But oh, like the, the pro um, hormone stuff. Yeah, the pro hormones were always like, "Ooh, what's that?" And yeah. Like, Nothing don't waste your money so yeah and some of them were almost the other side like was it one was it one testosterone i think it was one methyl testosterone i think and people got some pretty good gains from it but also a huge amount of water and i saw a couple guys liver enzymes from it which were absolutely freaking scary <laughs> Oh, it's like, man. oh, shit. <laughs> Can I stop whatever you're doing now, please? Yeah. Which I, the... I even find to this day, like, if a supplement was super effective, my first thought is it, it almost scares me, right? Because, like, on all the stuff we know so far, it's like, what is the the cost that you're paying for that? Especially if it's new and it's kind of like an unknown thing, you know, because, as you know, like, I there's no real free physiologic lunch, right? There's stuff you can do that's, that's better, but if it's really good and someone says there's no side effects, then I'm like, you just don't know what they are, right? It's, if it's yeah. a little bit less effective, like creatine is a good example, right? Creatine, very effective, but you're still talking like you know, single digits and it's well studied and we have an idea of what you know, the side effects are, which are pretty much minimal, um, but we've got a good idea and it's not like you're going to gain 
20 pounds in a couple weeks either. You know, it's going to be a little bit here and there. So you're not seeing a massive effect size either. Yeah. The other one, so the, the, the other one was the clenbuterol memetics. So like, uh, I don't remember the name of them, but there are a couple that were just like really off the wall. It was really supposed to be like the beta three agonist supposedly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and some of the back way back then, the bodybuilders used to take like the real thing. Cause it's, it's just like an asthma medication yeah. essentially. Yeah. Clint is. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was interesting to see the knockoffs of that. Um, I don't think those panned out either. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. And then, Transitioning a little bit, but related, um, you talked about the effects of NSAIDs, which to me has always been super interesting because on one hand you see, even in, I'd say, lay literature, there's always kind of an over and under reaction to stuff, right? I think some of the early mouse studies that looked at NSAIDs, people were like, oh, it's horrible. Don't ever take this. It's going to destroy all your muscle growth. But yet I knew people who were pretty big who took a fair amount of NSAIDs and it didn't seem like it was harming them all that much per se, you know? Yeah. Um, and then fast forward, we saw some other um, data. We saw some stuff from uh, Trappy that was done in older adults that showed it was probably a minor anabolic even, like it actually helped with some muscle growth. So what are your thoughts about just NSAIDs in... Uh, particular on muscle growth and we'll get a little bit more detailed from there into some of the stuff you presented at ISSN. Yeah. So, um, NSAIDs are interesting because like, and maybe give I, us a little background on what actually NSAIDs are for people listening who are like NSAIDs, what is he even talking about? <laughs> yeah. So your, so your ibuprofen, you know, um, your aspirin, your things like that. Um, they're non-steroidal and anti-inflammatory, um, drugs. So NSAIDs, that's the initials. Um, basically, they they block the COX inhibitors, and your COX enzymes convert lipids in your cell membrane. So, like, think about you know your muscle cell, or just pretty much any cell in your body has has a membrane around it to protect it. So, it when you get injured or something happens, your membrane kind of breaks down. It goes through these COX uh, enzymes and gets converted to prostaglandins which are like inflammatory signals um so it tells your body hey you know something's injured here we need to infiltrate with you know cells and kind of clear it out or we need to heat it up or swell it or we need to do something to to stop it um which is great so, because that's a purely a local effect too so it's a way of getting things to the spot where you actually have some of the damage without having as much whole systemic type things too yeah, yeah, exactly. So these drugs block different aspects um, of these COX enzymes, and there's two COX enzymes, COX-1 and COX-2, and so different drugs stop each one. So I think, like, celecoxib is a prescribed NSAID, and it blocks COX-2 specifically, uh, not really COX-1. Ibuprofen is kind of like a middle-of-the-road type drug where it blocks a little bit of both, and it's not super specific. Um, and then we have flurbiprofen, which is another prescribed drug that blocks COX-1. Hmm. Uh, and, there, and there's like 10 in set. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, but those are the ones that, that we use and probably the most common ones. Like even that said, most of the listeners probably have no idea what salicoxib and flurbiprofen are. They probably just know ibuprofen. Yeah, because they're prescription-based, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, so it, and it's kind of hard to get that because even when you go like after surgery and stuff and get a, a drug, they just give you high dose ibuprofen it's yeah like, that's what i've typically seen to your motrin yeah motrin yeah here's 800 milligrams of an inside yep <laughs> <laughs> um so yeah so that's that's the background um i'm impressed with your knowledge of the inside literature because the trappies have probably done some cool stuff by the coolest yeah. stuff i think yeah super um, fascinating um but it is in older adults yes so when you look at some of the younger adult literature it's kind of like there's some hints that if you take a whole bunch of NSAIDs, like I'm talking the equivalent of a whole day, if you took it every, what, four hours, so like 1,200 milligrams, which is like four, four pills usually, uh, if you took it all at once <laughs> and then did some resistance training, it would kind of inhibit or partially inhibit some of the muscle protein synthetic response, yeah. right? And which is not ideal for people trying to grow muscle. Um, and so... 
you know, the, there's a couple studies that show that, and the, the TRAPI studies show the older adults' data where it's anabolic. Um, and actually, so during my postdoc, I wrote a, a little grant um, on muscle inflammation susceptibility. Hmm. And that's this idea that older adults, one of the reasons they don't, um, or this NSAID may be working or other drugs, is because they're more susceptible to the inflammatory response, just like the normal training inflammatory response, they can't handle it. And so now you give them NSAIDs, they can handle it better. And so now it's anabolic. So mm. do you think that's because you're changing the mechanism of, I hate to use a Goldilocks thing all the time, but they're having almost too much inflammation that may be impairing that process, you're kind of bringing it back down to a better level and not so much because you're leaving any pain or any analgesic effect that they could do more training. There's actually a molecular mechanism there. I think so. And so we dug into it and, and I never, like I looked at a couple things, but you have to kind of pick your spots and I picked the wrong spots <laughs> <laughs> um, or, or maybe it's, it's not that big of an effect um, molecularly and it, it is the analgesic effect. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's hard to teach those out um, yeah. because you essentially need two types of drug. You need one that, kind of stops pain right the exact same drug that doesn't stop pain and that yep. doesn't really exist right yeah. now <laughs> um so yeah i think i think they're they're useful in moderation but when people use them a whole bunch at once it's probably not a good idea that's what i tell most people yeah and by a whole lot you were talking dose like 1200 milligrams which like how many tablets would that be for just the person listening if they're going to the store and buying like advil yeah, so like three to four at a time. Which, yeah, so pretty high dose. Yeah, yeah, and and most people aren't going to do that. Even like your, I think your endurance athletes are probably the most like abusers or yeah. frequent users. Try you know people like do triathlons and, and long distance stuff, and even them they'll just like pop one like a day or something and be fine. So yeah, I think it was it was overhyped for a while, and then it was kind of cool with the older adult data. And now we're trying to figure out, um, kind of leaning into some of my research, like which NSAID is best for which situation and so that we can say, hey, you know, you had a muscle strain, you should take this NSAID. Mm. Hey, you had a, a, a stress fracture in your leg, which is a, a problem in the army population. Um, take this NSAID because it won't affect your bone. And your muscle is, you know, we're not worried about your muscles when your bone's broken. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> <laughs> right. A little triage there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And just be like, yeah, oh, let's just walk it off. Can't can't walk off broken. <laughs> um, so yeah, we um I guess leading into the the more detailed stuff, we we did cell culture data and kind of screened these drugs and figured out that, you know, not too much was going on unless we gave a whole bunch. Um, which matches kind of the human stuff, right? If you take a whole bunch, it's bad. Uh so then we were moving into an animal model and we're in the middle of this study now, but we give five or six different NSAIDs to animals that are running on treadmills for six weeks. And, you know, it's not like perfectly translatable to humans, but it's, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Um, and we can, we're going to take some bones and muscles and see which NSAID was the best, worst, or which, you know, different molecular pathways and things, and just try to kind of tease out what's happening. Um, and then kind of the third arm is the, the human aspect. And so we are going to give humans a bit, um, not a big dose, a, a normal dose of, it, of different NSAIDs. So like ibuprofen and celecoxib and, and things like that. And then just have them do exercise and then measure, we're going to take some biopsies. And we're not going to do muscle protein synthesis stuff, but we'll do kind of the, the surrogates of that and um, we'll get some bone biomarkers. So, you know, getting more closer to like realistic use stuff. Um, I think long-term... There are a couple studies that have actually given NSAIDs over like 12 weeks while you're mm. resistant training. And it's kind of like the TRAPI data where it's it's okay and not detrimental for older adults, but depends what you're looking at. Um, and so not nobody's ever really done that in younger, healthy people. Um, there's one study where they did it and they did bicep curls and they measured bicep size and no, nothing happened. Um, but they use normal dose and that's not super surprising. So again, I don't, I think if you're taking normal doses, it, you're probably fine. Um, there may be a caveat if you have like a, 
a broken something that maybe it's not a good idea, but also you're in a lot of pain then. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like that, that catch 22 you mentioned, it's like, ah, do I want to be in pain or do I want my, my bones to heal 10% slower, faster, you know, so. And is there data on NSAIDs, like currently you're talking about bone healing that is theoretically better, worse, or kind of neutral for that? Because I'm assuming it's different mechanisms, it sounds like. Yeah, so it, it's in the animal stuff, it's pretty detrimental. Like, hmm. it, like if you, it, again, animal models, um, but right. in compression models, and they just like compress legs of animals, kind of like you would, I don't know. There's not really a, a good example in a human, uh, but they give them NSAIDs and they compress their muscles and their bones. So they're like getting stressed and there's like a 20% difference in adaptation, which is pretty big. Hmm. Um, and that's with like an Advil, like a mixed COX-1, COX-2. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. And so, and so we're working with some people who have done those studies to, to try to figure out like, Hey, you know what, what's happening? Cause 20% is a lot. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we'll see how it turns out, but I think I think there's some solid animal data. There's some really solid cell culture data, um, and then the human stuff and muscles, way more um, known than the bone side. And I'm again, I'm not a bone person, muscle person here, so I have to like lean on my my fellow colleagues and be like, hey, what does this mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, so in theory, that may make it worse for endurance athletes, right? Because I'm thinking about overuse injuries, you know, lower body, and the endurance athletes I know tend to take it more frequently because they tend to run almost every day or six days a week, where the lifters I know tend to, yeah, like every other day is probably a heavier session. And granted, there's exceptions to all of that, but I'm just thinking about mechanism of injury and frequency and dose, etc. Yeah, yeah. So I think... We also have a kind of a observational study going, and um, the ki the cadets or trainees who come in for basic combat, um, and so they have a really big stress fracture problem, and we think it might be due partially, you know, not all of it, but partially due to inset consumption, and so mm -hmm. we're kind of like monitoring monitoring this huge cohort of um, basic combat trainees to see if like is if they take NSAIDs, are they more likely to get a stress fracture? Are they less likely to recover? Like, you know, how does it play a role in that aspect? And I think that's more of the overuse injury because those kids are not trained. Like, they're going from untrained to trained in eight weeks. Mm -hmm. um, Oof. Yeah, and, and so it's, <laughs> it's not quite endurance athletes, but it's pretty close. Yeah, and I would imagine, again, you're stuck with, they have an analgesic effect too, so... I, you know, most people who are using NSAIDs are using it for an analgesic effect. So you could argue that, you know, one of the cofactors is looking at, okay, so I've got some pain, which is indicating, oop, something might be going on, but, oh, I can take an NSAID and mask it and I can keep doing that type of, of training. So now I can kind of, unfortunately, push a little bit further and, you know, have a higher risk of injury going on. Yeah. And there's a couple, um, analgesics i think aspirin is one that that's what i was gonna ask is it a different mechanism i'm trying to remember what aspirin is and i can't yeah it is it's one of it's acetylsalicylic acid um but it, it's a different mechanism and mm. so that's what i generally tell people to take like if you're having issues with pain is take aspirin um now the only problem with aspirin was the whole like gut bleeding problem right yeah so th so it's like Pick your what poison. Do you want? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, and I think acetaminophen, so Tylenol, is different entirely in that can potentially have more liver issues at higher doses, correct? Yeah, yeah. So acetaminophen. So those are our, our three like ibuprofen, acetaminophen, and, and Tylenol are kind of like they do the same type of things, but they do them differently. And one's worse at a certain thing, and the other's worse at something else. And does acetaminophen, does that modify Cox enzymes too, or is it preferential one direction or the other? Um, I'm pretty sure it's in the middle. Okay. I, don't think, I, don't I thought it was it's... middle but different mechanism, but I'm not sure at all. <laughs> yeah, it's like, this is a newer research area for me, but and we're not even using acetaminophen. Yeah, it's not so something I'm... you're working with at all. So. Yeah, yeah, so I'm like, what is it? What is it? Yeah. <laughs> it's a good question, though.
Yeah. And I know that the potential risk of liver toxicity with that can be rather high, especially if you're using escalating doses over long periods of time. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. No, very cool. So if someone is trying to work to avoid overuse kind of stress injuries independent of NSAIDs, any recommendation from just kind of what you've observed? Because you're kind of also dealing with a worst case scenario where you're going from untrained people to, hey, you got eight weeks to be trained. Here we go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what I think is um, – a key is not increasing your volume load or, you know, your running mileage too quickly. And I think there's a, oh, what is it? Tim Gabbett put out um, yeah. a couple papers on this topic where it's like, you don't want it to be 1.2 fold higher. So like 20% yeah, higher. Like the load each, spike stuff. Yeah. The, the, basically each week you want to avoid big jumps um, and, or even like, you know, across a couple weeks, maybe two or three weeks. Uh, I think like having to become more of a runner, I have to be careful because like, it's like, all right, well, you only tested on two miles, but then this other test is like a five mile and mm. you should probably be able to run eight miles just because, and oh yeah, you're going to have to ruck 12 miles with four pounds. Yeah. <laughs> and so it's like managing all of those different endurance activities, right? within kind of a, almost like a meso cycle um but yeah I, I generally tell endurance athletes i'm like just don't ramp up real fast don't like come back from vacation after two weeks and then try to run you know 90 percent of your max mileage like it's not going to work out well yeah and that's one thing i found with a lot of people i work with too like so i don't work with a lot of endurance athletes but people are doing you know, kind of mixed goals and crossfit and wanting to climb mountains yeah. and different things that in general, I'm like, if we can mix up modalities, I, I find that that works well. Like do a run day, maybe do a bike day and do a day on the rower. Or if I have athletes that are much more on the, the meathead side, I don't trust them running a lot because I've seen most of them run and it's pretty scary. So yeah. it's like, uh, let's use the bike and use the rower because you know, they don't have a goal of, of running. So it's not even going to be specific um, to them. Um, but like in your case, it gets a little bit trickier because you've got specific goals that are, you know, rucking or running base. So you can't get around the fact that you're going to have to practice that particular thing. And then it's just trying to manage the the load and the stress and split it out more. Yeah. And one of the things that I did was um, I went and actually got some, some running shoes, like some mm. good running shoes. Um, and I tried a bunch of different brands, like the you know the Asics and the Brooks and the what is the Shinoka or something, and the the On brand. But like putting those shoes on and running after not being a runner and not having good running shoes, and then having those, being like, wow, that's worth the 150 bucks or whatever it is going to cost me. Um, so I found that made a huge difference for me. Yeah, I even got this. I, I should know better, but I've got this beat into my head a lot more now because. Some stuff I'm really cheap on, and my wife yells at me like overly cheap. Um, I'll spend, you know, six, seven thousand dollars on a metabolic cart to have at home, and then, you know, thousand, twelve hundred dollars on a moxie setup, so I get to look to see what's going on with muscle oxygenation. But yet I'll wear the same pair of shoes I got for free for like a year and a half. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, and, I understand. And what I realized was, I'm like, I knew the soles were getting kind of bad, and you tend to, you know, have different wear patterns in them. But I'm like, oh, they're not that bad. And then I finally broke down, bought a new pair of shoes. The shirts weren't even that expensive. And then I realized once I put them on, I was like, holy crap, this is like so different. And then you compare the patterns on the bottom and you're like, whoa, I was an idiot for wearing these like for, you know, so long because you, I was good at fixing my gait. And then I realized after doing even longer walking and just a little bit of running, it would like revert back. And I'm like, oh, I'm probably just tired. You know, I'll cut back on mileage a little bit, watch my volume. And what I realized was the shoes were basically like forcing me back into this old position, more of the gait position I had once I got the shoes. And so once I got the new ones, it was like, oh, wow, everything like sticks so much better. And it doesn't feel horrible when I'm done because I'm not going back into that kind of poor gait pattern again. So, yeah, yeah. And I, I'm, I'm the same way. Like I'll... I'll cheap out on stuff. And it's, it's just like, I think it's the mentality. I don't know if you still have it, but from like just doing a PhD and being kind of like just poor for a really yeah. long time. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's like I'm used to make, making like right at the poverty line and now I'm yeah. not. 
It's like, oh, okay, I can buy a, a nice pair of shoes. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah, that was like a big change for me too. When I started traveling a couple of years ago, like for probably the first two years, I was like, oh, if I'm traveling, I can do a fast. I can do all these things. And you're so used to going to the grocery store and buying cheaper food. I can buy a bunch of chicken breasts and white rice and the carbs don't cost much money. And I, I tend to very much cheap out when I, when I was traveling and I realized I'm like, Oh, you know what? Like maybe if I ate a little bit higher quality food, which means just allowing myself to spend a little bit more money and it was nothing like exorbitant, you know? And I remember the first time I did it, I was at a, I was presented at an NCA conference in Jacksonville, maybe three or four years ago now. And I'm like, okay, I got here took the Uber to the, the Whole Foods that was nearby. I had a hotel. It had a fridge and everything. So I'm like, okay, so I'm actually going to buy, like, nice food so I have good food for the three days. Go into the store, buy it, and I get to the checkout, and I realize I left all my credit cards in my room, which is a <laughs> mile and a half away. I didn't have a rental car. I took the Uber there, and I'm like, oh. So I'm telling the person this and the store closes in like a half hour because I got in there late at night and I'm like, okay, just set them aside. I'll try to get the Uber. I'll run back or something. And this lady behind me, she's like, no, I got it. And I was like, what? She's like, no. And like before I turned around, she had already paid. She didn't even sign the thing and like ran out the door. She's like, no, don't worry about it. And I'm like, shit, that was like $135 worth of groceries that she just paid for. So I was like, wow that was crazy um and i'm like well what are the odds that the time i actually go to spend money i didn't have enough cash to cover it and then yeah, someone just bought all my food for the weekend i don't even know who she was so thank you whoever you were <laughs> yeah yeah that's a sign that's a sign that you were supposed to get that good food yeah 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 so now i've been trying to be since then more cognizant of like okay here's a list of stuff i'm going to spend money on and here's a list yeah I don't really care that much. I'll wear the same pants and shirts and, you know, whatever. Don't don't care so much. But I think having that division of what you're going to do and not do. Just like training stuff, right? It's like if this is my goal, here's I'm probably going to do this stuff and probably not so much of that stuff either. So, Yeah, life, life is all, all about balance and, like, finding that right, like, give and take, I think. And mm -hmm. trying not to, not to burn out and not to stress too much about things. So I, I think, you know. As of as of age up, it's it's been a little, a little eye opening. <laughs> yeah, and then the last part too, even less like training is adding like some exercise in that you really like doing is probably not going to make or break your training either. You know, like I remember seeing my bu a good buddy here was training some NFL athletes, and I I walked into his place on Friday, and I was like, hey man, like all these huge dudes are just doing a twenty minute arm session. I was like. I said, no offense, man, but like, why are they all doing arm stuff? And he's like, oh, we made a deal with them. I said, if they do all my training Monday through Thursday, they get to do 20 minutes of arm training on Friday. And so he's like, they all completed all the training. So today they get to do 20 minutes of arm training. I was like, oh, okay. And then I asked him, I said, well, no offense, but like, why do they care so much about arm training? Like, these are guys who are like literally legit starting people in the NFL this huge dude walks by and flexes his bicep and he goes, got to look good on TV, bro. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I realized. Nice. I'm like, this is probably like 13 years ago. And I'm like, oh, so elite athletes are humans too. Oh, no shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, I, um, so in high school, I played against Tim Tebow. And oh, wow. And I, yeah, so, but then in college, I was at the same college as him when he was there. And so it was... Like I worked a bit with strength and conditioning and I would train these like elite athletes and you're like, wow. But no, some of them were just like, no, I just want to do arms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't do that, man. Uh, you're, you're, you're a freshman. You gotta, you want to make varsity. You gotta keep going. Yeah. And it's also weird to see some of the, some of the very gifted athletes didn't really train that much and did yeah. amazing, you know, and yeah. then you've got, the elite of the elite who are very gifted in whatever forms and also train very hard. But my assumption when I was working with some of them was that, Oh, they all must work hard. And then you realize some do and some don't. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, and they still yeah. play well. And it's like, 
one guy actually got in an argument. He's like, I don't train that much, and I made the all-star team, and so I'm just not going to train a lot. And I'm like, okay, I guess for performance, I, I, I don't know. I guess you got me. I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's, some people are very gifted athletically without much work. It's it's nice, um, but I always I always think I'm like, well, what if you tried? How much I better know. would you be? <laughs> yeah, and that's what's so crazy. Last point too is I did some nutrition work for two high level uh, track athletes. They were in college, probably the top, easily top ten uh, runners. They're female in a hundred meter. And the great part about track stuff is you know if people are legit or not because everything is timed, right? So you can just look up their times online. Very easy to do. You know, if they're a football player or whoever, it's, it's, a, it's a little harder to e- equate performance. And so the coach said, you need to work with them. I'm like, great. So they sent me their uh, diet logs. And I look at it and I'm like, oh, the, their coach is like punking me. Like this, this has to be a joke. So I email them. I'm like, okay, is this really what you ate? Oh, yeah. Like, no, literally, this really, it was like fast food and like way under even just the normal amount of calories. And long story short, the coach had hired me. They didn't hire me particularly. Uh, long story short, uh, I got fired because they're basically like, this is what we eat all the time. We're running this fast. We don't care about nutrition. Get lost. Ouch. And I was like, oh, because then you, your assumption is like, well, but just think if we made some minor modifications, like you might be able to do even better. But their thought process was, I'm already doing this good eating trash, so I I, I don't care. It's not going to matter. You know, so yeah. it's like, oh, fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, uh, I guess that's okay. You live with it and be like, yeah, eh, fine. Yeah, yeah, whatever. It's, it's not my deal, but no. Yeah. Awesome. Well, if you want to be found, where would uh, people find out more about you? Yeah, so most of my content goes up on Instagram, so it's brob underscore um, twenty one. I do I usually do like series of topics, and so yeah, you got some really good stuff there. Yeah, so it, it's a lot of fun. I, I kind of couple it with some of my writing projects, um, but you can find me also on Facebook, just Brandon Roberts, uh, Twitter. Basically, Google me and you'll find me. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, I'm not that famous, but I'm, I've made enough content that something will pop up and you can kind of go through the, the trenches. Um, but definitely, you know, if your listeners have any questions, feel free to reach out. Uh, email is robertsb21 at gmail.com. So, you know, always open to, to chat. Cool. Well, thank you so much for taking the time out uh, to do this. I really appreciate you sharing all your knowledge and everything. And it's always. Always fun for for me to learn more new stuff, too, which is great. So thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Mike. Appreciate it. Cool. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast. Really appreciate it. A big thank you to Dr. Brandon Roberts for taking time out to chat about all the fun things we discussed from NSAIDs to myostatin supplements, genetic engineering, and so forth. If you enjoyed this podcast, if you could help me out by sharing it with someone who you think would be interested, leaving us a short review, primarily in iTunes or whatever uh, platform you want, and leaving us uh, whatever stars you think is appropriate. Um, So far, everyone has enjoyed it, but I think we had one person leave like a one star for some reason. But if that's you, then great. Uh, Send us any feedback at all. Really appreciate it. As always, this one is sponsored by the Flux Diet Certification. So go to flexdiet.com, F-L-E-X-D-I-E-T.com. You can get onto the wait list there, which will notify you the next time the certification opens up. We'll also put you on to the daily newsletter that has a vast majority of most of my content goes out there, and it's completely free. So go to flexdiet.com. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, please share it and give us whatever stars you feel is appropriate. Leave us a review uh, that helps us get bigger guests and more distribution of the show. Thanks again for listening. Talk to you next week.